Yes, what that means, and that's really legal talk, what it refers to is the fact that I come here to Bladensburg from time to time to enjoy the War of 1812 celebrations. And when I come out here, I uh, pass by the cross on my way to the waterfront park, or I pass by the cross on my way to other activities that are going on in the area. And it just reminds me that this cross is on public land. And I don't mind a cross per se, but knowing that it's on public land, knowing that it gives the impression that Bladensburg is a town that endorses one religion to the exclusion of others, that's the impression that's unwelcome. Again, what that means is, is that I would like to see the cross move to another location, that I would rather not continue to encounter the cross on public land. That's really the issue. The American Humanist Association has been around since 1941, and it's the nation's largest humanist organization. I was executive director of the American Humanist Association from 1984 to 1999, so I have a long history with the organization. Its membership represents a tiny portion of the population, but in terms of speaking out for secular-minded people of a similar viewpoint, we're talking that the association really represents closer to something like 15% of the American population because when you look at recent surveys such as the ERAS survey, according to that, according to the ERAS survey, which looks into what people think and what people believe and how their beliefs are changing and how many people don't believe in God, whether they uh, identify as, okay, it's the American Religious Identification Survey. Uh, people, many people identify with traditional religions like Jewish or Christian or whatever, but they may still not believe in God anymore, or they may still have abandoned many of the beliefs. Other people identify as secular, and so they created the category called nuns, N-O-N-E-S, people who don't have a religious identification. All right, so the American Humanist Association in many ways is a voice for the voiceless, a voice for people who, whether they are members or not, nonetheless uh, are attracted to our ideas. In fact, if you look at the Facebook reach of the American Humanist Association, on some weeks when there's a big news story, it comes to around three million. Again, a lot of people come to us and say, where have you been all my life? I thought I was the only one. I didn't know there was an organization for people like me. So we have a big job to do just finding our own audience and finding our own people. So clearly, we're not speaking just for our members. We're speaking for at least 15% of the American constituency. And that statistic is changing upwardly to where the next generation may be 20 to 30%. Oh, um, yes, my wife had a, had a religious upbringing, but she's a humanist just like me. Um, my two daughters, they didn't have a religious upbringing. I let them become familiar with religion, of course, but uh, they're of a humanist persuasion. Uh, my parents were very easygoing, laid-back Protestants, and they didn't see uh, being religious as a big virtue. You were supposed to believe, but you weren't supposed to be religious. That was kind of going a little too far. Yes, my dad served in World War II, he uh, fixed airplanes in Britain uh, during the entire conflict, and that was the role he played. My uncle Raymond uh, was a, a tank commander in World War II, and he served in the Battle of the Bulge. Well, my uncle Raymond died recently, and so he, he was never familiar with the lawsuit. And I don't know if my father is. He's 99 years old, so I haven't... I haven't tried to trouble him too much with my goings on. Well, it was during the Vietnam War that I came of age, uh, that I graduated from high school in 1967, and I was highly critical of the war, and I was against it. But nonetheless, I was called up for my draft physical, and I went. But I was a really skinny kid back then, and they also found that I had a hernia. So as a result of that, my being uh, very much underweight and also having that hernia, they wouldn't take me. They gave me what was called then a 1Y classification, 
which meant they would call me up if it were a national emergency. The Distinguished Service Cross is a, is a medal with a, a cross in which each of the parts is of equal length. And it's, a, it's the, yes, I know what it looks like, and it's the, and it's the second highest honor, uh, just under the Congressional Medal of Honor. Yes, so, uh, and it has, as, you, as your picture shows, it has an eagle in the center. But the main point to remember is that the bars of the cross are of equal length. It is not a Christian cross. What makes this a Christian cross is the fact that the stem is so much longer than the rest of the cross. Now, if that was made of equal length all the way around, it would not be a Christian cross and we would not have an issue here. The reason I cannot name a single one of them is because I have never been able to legally cross that street to go over to that plaque and read it and read the names off of it. That is on a median in the middle of a busy traffic interchange and therefore it is jaywalking and therefore illegal to cross over to there and it's dangerous. You take your life in your hands. And so I have never had the opportunity to go over and read the plaque and see the names on it. If we're trying to honor the war dead from World War I, why isn't the, the plaque part of the memorial over on this side of the street with the other war memorials? I have no objection to war memorials. They are on this side of the street in Bladensburg Waterfront Park, and none of them are religious. They are all secular, properly so, monuments to the war dead of various wars. World War I should be represented over here as well. That plaque should be moved to a monument on this side of the street, and the cross should be moved to a church. Well, I don't think there's anything wrong with the other memorials, and I don't think there's anything wrong with the way we've honored the war dead in other wars. And we have to remember that even back in World War I, there were Jews in the greater Washington, D.C. area who fought in that conflict. Uh, I've been reading about those times, and there were quite a number of Jews from the Washington, D.C. area who fought in that conflict. They may not have been from Prince George's County, however, because most of the Jewish population back then was centered in the district. And I don't think we should give the impression that we only honor Christian soldiers. We should give the impression that we honor all soldiers, that yes, there are atheists in foxholes. In fact, very often, you can't get an exemption from war if you're an atheist. So of course the atheists are in the foxhole. They don't let them go anywhere else. So the point is we want all monuments to the war dead to honor all the war dead, whether they be Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, atheist, or what have you. You can't go by what the population was at any given time, because if you do, you go back to the time of the American Revolution, and you find that the numbers were very different. In fact, the number, the percentage of professed Christians back then was much smaller than it was at the time of World War I. And so are we to judge religious freedom based on what the population happens to be at any given time? That would seem to be inappropriate. This country was founded on the principle of religious liberty and the separation of church and state. And so that means then that all religions are to be treated equal and the government is to show no favoritism to one religion or another despite what the population happens to be. Even if someone is a minority of one, they count and they have rights and liberties. So it shouldn't matter. You don't decide what the true religion is by counting noses and you don't decide religious liberty by counting noses. We would prefer, I personally would prefer, that the cross simply be moved to another location such as a church or other private property. Because let's face it, the cross does have historical and artistic significance and there's no need for it to be destroyed. But in the very nature of the lawsuit, being narrow as lawsuits are in their definitions, all the lawsuit calls for is the removal of the cross. That's all it can call for, it can't go beyond that. But me personally, I would like to see it preserved and moved to a better location where it isn't in this busy traffic interchange, where it is subject to deterioration due to smog and all of that. It actually needs to be moved to a better location, not only for the people who wish to view it, 
but a better location for the preservation of the cross itself. The political agenda of the American Humanist Association is mostly related to the separation of church and state and defending the rights of non-theistic people to the same religious liberties that religious people enjoy. That would be the political agenda. Well, if you drive by where that cross is now and you look at it, it looks for all the world like it's on public land. It looks for all the world like, okay, this is the, the, either the state of Maryland or the city of Bladensburg endorsing one religion. So even if you took a postage sized stamp piece of property right under the cross and said, okay, we're going to sell that to someone else, and therefore technically uh, it will belong to someone else, the passerby driving by would not get that impression. And when it's illuminated at night, it's just a bright cross-shaped light in the night. Uh, it, it gives the impression of Christianity and nothing else and it gives the impression of government endorsement of Christianity. That is not an adequate solution, and it is, in fact, it would require some kind of gerrymandering by the local politicians in order to make sure it was only sold to a Christian organization and not to anyone else. What if an atheist organization bid for that plot of land that they wanted to sell? They're supposed to have open bidding for any sale of any land that the public wants to sell, and free bidding and usually um, uh, you know, uh, anonymous bids, or that is, you know, they, they put them in envelopes and it goes to the highest bidder regardless of who they are. So, are they going to play fair that way? These are the issues that we always look at when those kinds of suggestions are proposed. And they have been proposed in the case of the cross on Mount Soledad in San Diego, where we've been involved. I'm originally from San Diego, so I'm very familiar with the Mount Soledad cross case. And they tried that business of uh, selling a postage stamp sized piece of land underneath the cross to the government. And that is still in the courts and that cross has finally been ordered to be taken down. Well, when you, when you take any kind of discrimination and say, well, it's just historical, so let's leave it up, uh, by that logic then you should uh, leave up any monuments to racism and other kinds of things in this country and I think we should be very very careful how we do that that if it is wrong now it was wrong then they might not have fully understood that it was wrong then but it was and we have to make sure that we stand by the principles upon which our country was founded not just by oh somebody made a mistake but it's been many many years so we'll just let the mistake stand that's not the way to do that I've been reading some of the history of that and how, uh, according to my research, it was never actually owned by the city of Bladensburg, but, uh, but it has been owned by the state of Maryland and it has had some previous owners. And I know that an important battle was fought right on that very site, the Battle of Bladensburg. So I do know that the land itself has a history that's interesting. My favorite president, well, I would say it was Thomas Jefferson, the man who uh, laid out the expression wall of separation between church and state in his letter to the Danbury Baptists. And in many ways, this cross being on public land um, compels people to view it when they come by and view it in a way that identifies it as a public monument and therefore offered by the government. And that basically runs afoul of what you just quoted from Jefferson. And so, yes, Jefferson throughout his life had differing opinions on the subject of God and Christianity. He uh, put together a book called, uh, well, which has since been called Jefferson's Bible, wherein he went through the New Testament, uh, the Gospels actually, and he, with a pair of scissors, literally, cut out all the miracles and just left the, the human story of Jesus. He believed that Jesus was a human being and never intended himself to be regarded as more than that. That was Jefferson's view of religion. That was Jefferson's Christianity. He was a deist, he believed in God, but he did not identify as a Christian. He more closely identified at the time as a Unitarian. 